It is such an honor for me to share with you all about Castleman disease. My name is David Fagenbaum, and I'm the founding director of the Center for Cytokine Storm Treatment and Laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania, and the co-founder and president of the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network. I first learned about Castleman disease when I was a medical student, when I myself became critically ill with the disease and have dedicated my life to unlocking etiology, pathogenesis, and evidence-based guidelines for this disease. Castleman disease describes a group of disorders that share the same appearance under the microscope, but behave quite differently. I think it's really important to subtype Castleman disease based on these clinically relevant features. So one form of Castleman disease is what's called unicentric Castleman disease, where there's a single region of enlarged lymph nodes, and these patients can have um, mild to moderate clinical and laboratory abnormalities. There's another form of Castleman's called multicentric Castleman disease. These patients have multiple regions of enlarged lymph nodes, tend to have a, a severe systemic inflammatory response, and, and what we often call a cytokine storm. Um, among uh, patients with multicentric Castleman disease, it's important to further subtype it into the cases that are caused by infection with human herpes virus 8, which we, which we call HHV8 associated multicentric Castleman disease. Poems associated with multicentric Castleman disease, where there's a monoclonal plasma cell population that's driving the lymphadenopathy. Finally, what we call idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease. These are patients with multiple regions of large lymph nodes, a cytokine storm, but no evidence of HHV8, no evidence of a cancer. These are idiopathic. We don't know the cause. Then within idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease, we often subtype patients as having what's called Tafro syndrome, which is the most severe cases who have progressive thrombocytopenia and organ dysfunction, versus idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease not otherwise specified. These patients often have thrombocytosis and a much more uh, chronic or less progressive uh, disease course. In order to make the diagnosis of unicentric Castleman disease, a patient needs to have a single region of enlarged lymph nodes, which may be either one enlarged lymph node or it could be multiple enlarged lymph nodes in the same area. Once that is identified, a lymph node biopsy is essential to cut the lymph node out and to look at it under the microscope to determine if that patient has histopathologic features that will be considered consistent with unicentric Castleman disease. If so, we would consider this patient to have unicentric Castleman disease, a single enlarged lymph node or regional lymph nodes with features consistent with Castleman disease. Alternatively, in order to make the diagnosis of multicentric Castleman disease, patients need to have multiple regions of enlarged lymph nodes, so disseminated lymphadenopathy. They need to have a lymph node biopsy performed to determine whether those lymph nodes have features that are consistent with multicentric Castleman disease, so atrophic germinal centers, increased plasma cells, increased vascularity. So you look for these particular features, and then once you have those, you now need to confirm that the patient also has clinical and laboratory abnormalities that would be consistent with multicentric Castleman disease, things like anemia, thrombocytopenia, fluid accumulation, fever. These minor criteria are required. You need at least two of the 11 minor criteria with at least one of them being a laboratory abnormality. And finally, you need to meet exclusion criteria. You need to rule out diseases like lupus and lymphoma that can mimic multicentric Castleman disease. And importantly, for it to be idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease, you need to make sure that there's no evidence of human herpes virus 8 by staining a lymph node and checking for this infection.
At this time, I'd like to present a case to really bring Castleman disease to life. We've got a 16-year-old boy who presents to the emergency department with just about a week of a flu-like prodromal illness um, where his pediatrician one week earlier had suggested that he stay home um, due to a likely viral illness. But now he presents to the emergency department with worsening fatigue, um, severe night sweats the night before. And so in the lab, uh, they decide to perform a number of tests. Uh, CBC reveals mild anemia, um, but normal platelet counts. Uh, inflammatory markers reveal increased CRP and elevated ESR. And a CMP reveals uh, mildly elevated creatinine. And a serum protein electrophoresis reveals elevated gamma globulin levels. So based on these laboratory abnormalities, um, uh, a physical exam is done, and then imaging is done, and that reveals that there's generalized enlarged lymph nodes throughout this 16-year-old boy, as well as splenomegaly. So at this stage, um, I think you all would be thinking that maybe this patient has lymphoma, uh, an infection like mono, or maybe an autoimmune disease, um, and it's really important to do further workup to determine what it is. The patient was admitted, and um, given that uh, high-dose steroids didn't improve symptoms right away and laboratory abnormalities, and given that the infectious workup was completely negative, uh, it was determined to take out one of these lymph nodes to determine if this patient had lymphoma or some other lymphoproliferative disorder. And upon um, excision of the lymph node, it became clear this patient had plasma cytosis, so sheets of plasma cells between germinal centers and had these atrophic germinal centers along with expanded mantle zones. These are the features that you often see with Castleman disease. And further staining for LANA1, which is a, a marker of HHV8 infection, was performed and turned out to be negative. And when you bring this case together, you've got a patient with multiple regions of enlarged lymph nodes, uh, pathology that's consistent with multicenter Castleman disease, HHV8 testing that's negative, indicating this is HHV8 negative idiopathic multicenter Castleman disease, and then four of 11 minor criteria. So in this young patient, we would then go to our treatment guidelines, and we would see that the first line recommended therapy for a patient like this would be anti-IL-6 therapy with sultuximab. We gave this patient sultuximab, and within three days of the first infusion, we began to learn of improvement in symptoms and also begin to see some of the laboratory abnormalities improve. By about seven weeks, um, each of the laboratory uh, abnormalities had completely returned to normal, um, and this patient was back to uh, his prior state of health. And then would be continued on every three-week dosing of sultuximab moving forward. I like to present a case of Castleman disease that can really help to bring this disease to life. So we've got a 31-year-old female who presents the emergency department with a month of fatigue, weight loss, and what she described as new blood moles, and about a two-week history of night sweats with five days of quite severe right, right upper quadrant pain, swelling around the ankles, but really no significant past medical history. Uh, on physical exam, it was clear that there was um, cervical and axillary lymphadenopathy. There was also this mild peripheral edema around the patient's ankles and these blood moles that had popped up on this patient's chest and shoulders. So laboratory testing was, was performed and was found to have uh, mild anemia, elevated creatinine, and mildly um, uh, low platelet counts. Given the multicentric lymphadenopathy, a full-body CT was performed, which confirmed diffuse lymphadenopathy, um, even within the thorax and, and also pelvis, um, but also revealed splenomegaly, uh, pleural effusions, and ascites. So this previously healthy 31-year-old 30 -year female has a number of quite concerning clinical and laboratory abnormalities. Given the abnormal um, 
clinical and laboratory features that were observed, the patient was admitted to the hospital and unfortunately, over the course of the next few days, progressed rapidly requiring admission to the intensive care unit due to multi-organ system failure. Um, after uh, several days of progressive uh, organ dysfunction, um, gaining uh, over 40 pounds of fluid with anasarca due to severe renal dysfunction that required dialysis, um, uh, along with very low albumin levels and severe systemic inflammation. Um, the patient continued to progress, um, experienced an acute retinal hemorrhage that caused temporary blindness, transaminitis, uh, as well as quite severe anemia and thrombocytopenia that required um, daily transfusions. Uh, as the patient continued to get worse and worse, a lymph node biopsy was performed after um, infectious disease workup came back negative and there was no clear autoimmune etiology uh, for this disease. The lymph node biopsy came back consistent with idiopathic multicentric calcium disease. It was particularly vascularized and could sometimes be described as the hypervascular histopathological subtype. So when you put everything together, we've got a patient with multiple regions of enlarged lymph nodes that meets the first major criteria. Histopathological features of that lymph node consistent with multicentric calcium disease. HHV8 testing is negative, so now both major criteria are achieved for idiopathic multicentric calcium disease. And then 10 out of 11 minor criteria were achieved for this particular patient. So between the multi-organ failure, the systemic inflammatory syndrome, and the fluid accumulation that was observed, this patient met nearly all 11 minor criteria for the diagnosis. And importantly, exclusionary criteria, including lymphoma, um, a number of autoimmune conditions, and infectious diseases, were all ruled out. So this patient has idiopathic multicentric calcium disease based on the acute and severe presentation along with the severe thrombocytopenia. This patient would be considered to have the idiopathic multicentric calcium disease TAFRO subtype, which is by far the most severe. Now that the diagnosis is made, the patient should be immediately started on anti-IL-6 therapy with siltuximab. Given that this patient is quite severe, um, concomitant high-dose corticosteroids should also be given along with the siltuximab, and daily monitoring is essential. You need to make sure that there is no progressive organ dysfunction while the patient is on anti-IL-6 therapy, and if needed, give accelerated weekly dosing of siltuximab instead of the typical every three-week dosing. So in this patient, we track the patient daily for signs of organ dysfunction, and unfortunately, around day eight, organ dysfunction continued to progress. The patient required even more frequent dialysis, even more frequent transfusions, and laboratory abnormalities were not improving. Given this progressive organ dysfunction, despite being on IL-6 blockade, the patient was started on multi-agent chemotherapy, adromycin, cytoxin, atoposide, velcade, dex, lidomide, rituximab, this combination of seven chemotherapies while continuing the siltuximab did result in a very substantial improvement in the particular patient, which was fantastic news for the patient. I was able to discontinue um, dialysis and was able to return to her prior state of health. Unfortunately, she would go on to have subsequent relapses, and it became critical that we identify a therapy that could try to keep her in remission. Based on work in my laboratory uncovering an important role for mTOR activation in idiopathic multicentric calcium disease, and given that this patient had relapsed on anti-IL-6 therapy and had required multi-agent chemotherapy, we decided to treat her with serolimus, an mTOR inhibitor that's been around for decades um, and has been able to show benefit in, in a subset of patients with idiopathic multicentric calcium disease that have been treated with it. And this patient had a very impressive response to therapy with a durable remission. Um, we now have a clinical trial open of the mTOR inhibitor serolimus for INCD patients who are relapsed or refractory on anti-IL-6 therapy. I thought I'd take a moment to talk a little bit about how and, and why we treat idiopathic multi center calcium disease the way that we do. So in IMCD, we know that a number of uh, potential triggers can lead to this cytokine storm, and typically 
Interleukin-6 is the key driver in the cytokine storm. So the patients experience systemic inflammation, organ dysfunction, and cytopenia is due to the excess levels of cytokines, including IL-6. So importantly, we always start out by blocking interleukin-6 with a targeted antibody called sultuximab. That's first line of therapy, and it works very well in about one-third to one-half of patients. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for everyone. So if a patient does not respond to IL-6 blockade, if they progress while on IL-6 blockade, then if they're very severe, we recommend chemotherapy. If they're not yet in the severe category, that's where immunomodulators like mTOR inhibitors like serolimus and drugs like rituximab can be considered to treat these anti-IL-6 refractory patients. And in doing so, you're hitting other aspects of the immune system. So even if IL-6 is not the driver, we know that other cytokines are playing critical roles. So hitting signaling pathways like mTOR or JAK-STAT are other ways to dampen the cytokine storm.